Can I call the meeting to order, or something like order? Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I was just discussing uh, with Sophie here the, the fact that there are more fossil fuel industry people uh, here at COP26 than there are uh, delegates from any one country. Um, so this is a panel which is going to be slightly contrary uh, to all of that. I just wanted to say one other thing, which is um, just to re uh, congratulate the people who put this event together, created the platform on which our remarkable actors are now going to do their piece, but also to thank the people who've helped our remar rem remarkable actors get here in the first place. We're all part of ecosystems. There are so many people out there really hoping that this succeeds and takes the debate um, and action in a very different uh, way. So I'm John Elkington. Uh, again, welcome to this uh, session, which will run for just shy of, or just short of uh, 60 minutes. Um, uh, I do hope that we'll have some audience participation, so um, comments, questions, and all the rest of it would be uh, very welcome. The theme, just in case you've come in here to cool down from other uh, venues, this one is the next frontier, and the subtitle is Positive Impact Beyond Net Zero. So we'll try and keep the technical jargon out of this, but one of the uh, symptoms of a change in agenda is that new terms, new words come up, everyone starts to use them, and very often definitions get a little bit confused uh, along the way. Can I ask two questions? I, I, I know the answers from the panelists, but I'd actually ask them to join in uh, the game. How many of, for how many of you is this your first COP? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, I mean, this is really interesting because I think what's remarkable about COP26 is it's pulling in a wave of different people and there are many people like uh, Greta Thunberg are saying it's a failure already. I don't think so. I think what's happening is it's, it's the beginning of a shift into a very different type of discussion and the fact that um, young people are now here in such numbers, they may be frustrated, but that's the beginning of a a learning curve for us all. The second question is this, how many of you went on the, uh, the Fridays for Future march the other day? A rather small number, but what was really dramatic about that, and, and Louise Kjellerup Roper, our CEO, and I, I went, was how, how many of the people there were ordinary people? All age groups, complete social spectrum, many of them come in from very different places to be part of it. It was very good humored, but people are increasingly agitated and wanting action. And it's a misfortune of ours in some ways that the spotlight now is going to business because many people no longer have the confidence that they might once have had, and this is different in different parts of the world, but in governments to deliver on the time scales and the scale. So people are wanting um, business to act. And I think it's in that context that we will be talking today. And some of you may have gone to the uh, B-Lab UK and Body Shop event a couple of days ago where they mocked up a boardroom of the future and had five young people come in and talk with um, David Boynt and the CEO and so on. I, I was slightly disappointed. I don't think the, 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 the quality of the advice that was coming through from the younger people as yet was good enough to really move the needle but I think this is, as I say, a learning curve. Just before I introduce the panelists, we're, just to go back to that Tower of Babel uh, issue, that among the words that are coming up, there are lots that start with re. Some of you remember two or three years ago, the Financial Times did a, 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 a cover which was yellow, and it was, you know, capitalism, time for a reset. You've got WBCSD uh, talking about... Um, uh, reinvention, resilience, regeneration, and I'm sure we'll talk about all of those in different ways earlier on. And I want to thank the, um, the supporters of this event, Actiona, and we'll hear from their CEO in a moment. Uh, the CLG group, that's Corporate Leaders uh, Group, uh, WPCSD, and the We Min Business uh, Coalition. And just finally, uh, from me, uh, there are three 
broad themes that we will be trying to address, but I'm sure we'll go off in many other areas. And the first one is um, low carbon strategy. What does that look like? How can that be delivered? How do markets reward that if they do? The second is um, how does each of these leaders uh, in front of us today uh, think about the transition and how are they trying to not only push it in the right direction, but accelerate uh, the pace and scale of that transition. And then a, a perhaps a rather personal question, which is, what does it feel like and what does it mean to be a leader in this new space, where you're actually making stuff up as you're uh, moving forward? And that's never easy. Uh, it's great fun. But all of the uh, businesses that we have in front of us are indeed pioneers. So what I'm going to do is um, start off uh, in um, reverse order by the first uh, letter of the brand name of each company. So, Alan, I'm afraid that puts you in the spotlight from Unilever. Um, and Alan Jope took over as CEO from Paul Pullman, many of you will know, in 2019, I think. Um, inherited the sustainable living uh, plan sort of work. But one of the remarkable things about Unilever is over now over a decade, uh, Globescan, their survey, just always puts um, Unilever right at the top. So that's not an accident, I think. Maybe your publicity is quite good, but I, I, it's not an accident. People can actually see, uh, to some considerable degree, what you're doing. And operating in 190 countries. So this blizzard of nationalities probably feels uh, quite normal to you and probably to our other speakers as well. Then we come to IKEA, and I was just saying to Juvencio, I, I was outside um, sitting in an IKEA um, uh, chair outside, which had this sort of second life identity. So however you've done it, you're everywhere. But when I think about IKEA, I think about not just a retail giant, but one that has really moved the needle at scale on a series of different uh, priority issues. So it would be wonderful to hear more about you uh, and, and, and what you're aiming to do on that. You, I think, for six years ran IKEA in India, which is a different world uh, of its own, and you're a sailor, and I hope you will experience today that there's a following wind in some ways behind what uh, people are li like you are now trying to do. Which brings us to DSM. Um, and, and, and Geraldine uh, Machet is co-CEO, I think, um, previously CFO uh, with FICA Cybersmart. Many of you will have seen DSM morph and evolve over the years. Originally, back to the introductory thing about how many fossil fuels people there, it, the, the story was a fossil fuel story. And it's an extraordinary migration that DSM has gone through. I mean, it was Dutch state mines, I think. Um, into life sciences and into sustainability is an integral part of your uh, strategy. So again, thanks very much for joining us. And then Axiona, um, Jose Manuel Antricanales is part of the, the family behind uh, the business in infrastructure and renewable energy at a very considerable uh, scale. And when I've uh, listened to Jose Manuel and other people in the company, the sorts of terms and language that they use include business un as unusual, positive impact, decarbonization, and increasingly regeneration. And I think, again, we'll come back to all of those sorts of things. So what I would like to do is then reverse the order and start with Jose Manuel. And just ask you, uh, you've obviously been to COP meetings before. What do you come here looking for? And, and, and are you already beginning to find it at this meeting or not? Hi. Um, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. You have to be a bit louder. Is it, is it clear? It's better. Okay. Um, that's good. You've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> what do, that's a very difficult question. What do I come to that's COPS for? One. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's, it's always a gathering. I mean, this, I put it in a, if you're a dentist, you go to the dentist um, reunion, annual reunion, yes. and, uh, and you all get together. If you're in the climate change uh, arena, you um, need to be here and you need to see what's happening and you need to contact all your colleagues and get together and see how things are evolving and judge, get the feeling of where we are. Now, 
My feeling is that things are evolving from civil society faster than they are evolving from uh, a regulatory side or from uh, uh, the political side. And the feeling I get in this uh, last COP is that it's hugely bigger than what I've seen from the civil society side. Hugely bigger. And uh, the amount of, you know, of uh, civil society people around here is bigger than ever. And uh, now, I have the doubt, and I'll leave it there, whether it is ideal for negotiators on the political side to be um, at the same stage as we are, because they should be they should be concentrating in negotiation. They should be concentrating in reaching agreement, and not distracted by all this, which is very useful to us. But to them, I'm not sure is the right thing. So I I have a doubt about that. I don't know. It's my view. That's provocative, and I'm sure we'll have some comments and questions around that. I, I actually think it is, at this stage of the game, without preempting the, the discussion, it's actually quite good, because the sense is we're watching you, and, and the fact that people are here and, and uh, paying attention, I think is quite um, positive. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how far they get, and then we'll, we'll see whether they're asking for less um, NGO engagement or whatever, civil society engagement. Geraldine, um, DSM went to many COPs over the years and played a very uh, positive role. This, I think, is your first one. What, what did you come here looking for? Well, because it's my first COP, um, I was actually looking for this interaction between the stakeholders. Uh, I feel maybe not very uh, well equipped to help the governments negotiate. Um, however, to get a, a bit, a much better clarity of what's on people's minds, but also to kind of, I think, uh, refill my own energy and passion for the cry out for speed, for action, for alignment, for uh, just exam good examples of how do we scale working together across stakeholders. And um, so, and I can't compare with how it was before. So for me, this is fantastic to see the interaction. And I do very much welcome, actually, that there are protests in the streets because I think we are going too slowly. Um, and we had a, a panel earlier today where we said one of the biggest, most important elements, and, and hopefully we'll get to talk about food and food systems at some point, is for consumers to want to change their own behaviors and then for everybody else to try and make it possible. Um, and therefore, to see that there is this, this impatience is for me actually a, a source of hope. Uh, which may be a little bit controversial as well, because I don't think they mean it that way. They mean it more as despair, and I take it as a source of hope. And, and I think you arrived yesterday. I mean, how, how do you intend to meet this lot? Because I, you know, I, I, I'm out in the corridors, and everyone is striding along with their bags and their coffees, and they all look as though they know what they're doing. I'm sure some of them do. Some of them perhaps end up in the wrong space or whatever. But how are you planning to engage the wider world of civil society here? Yeah. yeah, there's a number of ways. One is to um, have the willingness to stand here and answer questions, and then just the panel we did earlier creates already a whole number of connections. So just speaking up and, and opening the door and saying, let's discuss. Uh, there's also some very nice sessions, by the way, IKEA, thank you. Um, we will have tomorrow evening a very frank, um, is it a confrontation? Uh, certainly a coming together of very different parties. Yeah. Uh, and that also is, is a great opportunity with a lot of focus right now because the spotlight is on. So it's the right time to do it. Brilliant. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, Juvencio, that goes clearly to you. Uh, why are you here? I am here to take actions and to influence others. And building exactly what you said, I think it's not about connecting us. I think it's bridging the gap with the many people. Because I think the success of COP is not only commitment, it has to be actions, but it's also about bridging the gap with the many people. We, we run with Globescan a survey in 32 countries where we operate. And then we found that uh, 
seven out of 10 were really worried about climate, but only four said out of 10 that they were taking actions. And the, ba the many barriers is because A, they don't know, B, it's too expensive. So I think it's uh, our role here, why I'm here, it's uh, to learn from others, but also to influence and to help to bridge the gap. We are lucky that we meet 1.2 billion visitors every year. So we have our big role to connect with the many people and to take COP into everybody's homes. Thank you. We'll come back to that uh, a little later on. And Alan, one of the striking things about Unilever was the succession, which went from Paul Pullman to you. And what used to happen, at least in my experience, was you'd have a CEO who was switched on, followed by somebody who then sort of dragged things back to where, you know, the, <laughs> the efficiency-driven people felt that they should have been. Whereas in, in, in the case of Unilever, it may not have been completely smooth, but it, from outside, it looked really impressive how that succession happened. So we'll probably get into that a little bit later on, but why are you here? I'm just coming home. Um, <laughs> I'm from Glasgow, but I haven't lived here since I was 17. This is the longest time I've spent in Glasgow since I was 17. Got to see my sister, which was great. Um, but on a business level, uh, for three reasons. Um, first, we've discovered that there's this um, positive loop between business and government, that um, the more we state our high ambition, the more it seems to embolden government to take um, bold action. And vice versa, as we hear about government making more uh, serious commitments, we're more confident that the policy framework will be there to support our ambitions. Um, so the first thing is to encourage government to aim high in the formal negotiations. Second is uh, we wanted to make sure that we were actively seeking a voice for nature. And um, I think we're delighted, actually, how much nature has uh, featured as part of the solution. And the third is to encourage the financial systems to step up to make sure that, at a minimum, uh, the uh, more developed countries are ponying up the money that was promised to less developed countries. Um, I think uh, we still have a disappointment in that regard, which is the most powerful way of decarbonizing our world would be to put a price on it. And it still feels too far away, too difficult, too complex to get some universal price on carbon. But embolden governments, be a voice for nature, and make, try and make sure the financial systems are moving. That's why we came here. Thank you. And, and, and the, the system change agenda has at least been referenced uh, a moment ago. And one of the things that we've seen in the last four or five years is people sort of getting a little bit frustrated with incremental change, a little bit excited around system change, uh, and maybe one of the benefits of having uh, 26 in this format, Jose Manuel, is that it is elements of the system in the same space at the same time and to sort of try and converge thinking and priorities and ambitions. But, Alan, if I can just stay with you for a moment, I mean, you're very active in a number of different systems, but critically in the agricultural and food and nutrition and health um, area. How do you see system change evolving there? Because there is a limit, even though a company like Unilever is pretty enormous, to what any individual company can do. So what's the balance between you on your own, we mean business, WBCSD, those sorts of platforms, and then, uh, yeah, what is the balance? Um, so we couldn't agree more that changing systems is difficult, it's hard work, and we have a model that we follow. I don't know if it's useful or not, but it's the model we use. And uh, think of it as four concentric rings. It begins with getting our own house in order. So if you take gender, making sure we uh, have adequate women representation up and down our organization. In this instance, we've already decarbonized our operations by 74% uh, since 2008. Then the next ring is our value chain. Um, the many suppliers that we've got and the many people in our distribution arrangements so we've asked all of our 56,000 suppliers to take action on decarbonizing um, as well. Has anyone said no and dropped out of your supply chain, or are they all genuflecting and so, wanting to play? So um, we have 
uh, a better example, because we're quite recent in asking our, our suppliers to decarbonize, is to pay a fair living wage. Um, and we also are asking our suppliers to pay a fair living wage. And some have stepped aside and some we've asked to step aside. Um, but that's the second ring. The third ring is what we can do with our brands. Probably the biggest force multiplier that Unilever has is getting our brands to offer low carbon purchasing alternatives to consumers. And it's only after all of that that we get to the area you were asking about, which is partnerships, policy, advocacy. If we're going to take action on the climate emergency or the loss of nature or growing inequality, of course no one actor can do it. It's going to require governments, uh, the private sector, civil society, academia working collaboratively. And I do think that's one of the values of events like this. It does bring us together at a focal point. Thank you. And Juvencio, I mean, we've talked about system change, we've talked about positive impact, we've not yet mentioned circular economy and things like that, but when IKEA is thinking about all of this, what sort of language are you using internally before you then go out and explain what you're doing to the wider world? We are lucky that the, we have a strong vision for many years to get a better life for the many people. And this climate, this COVID that is testing the deep understanding of the vision. Because the important thing is the actions. And when people in the business are taking action, they face dilemmas. So the internal language is how to uh, eliminate these dilemmas. For example, sustainability is a luxury for the few. No, it has to be affordable for the many. For example, sustainability is a problem for the PNL. No, it's good business to be good business. Sustainability is complex. No, it has to be simple. So the, the way we address this is based on the values, but taking actions internally to avoid those dilemmas. Half, then we are very proud of the half food glass, and then we still have a half empty glass that we are really working hard before 2030. Because in the essence, uh, I think it's about working in our case in two fronts. One is to drastically reduce, reduce the emissions of the IKEA value chain, but, uh, and we are committed to do that by reducing by half before 2030. But the other fine, the other part is to not only being a good company, it's also influence behavior. And this is where we have a big role to play with the many people. So I would say it goes back to the essence of the IKEA vision in this case. And, and so you've had a vision for a long time. One of the things I've always felt or thought is that when we really start to move, when action really does start to happen, there will be an accelerating rate of failures in business because not everyone can get this right first time round. And this is not to just you, Juvencio, but what's been one of the biggest failures or learning opportunities along that sort of learning curve that IKEA has come up? I think the, the, uh, the big opportunity we found, or the, you could say, the, because we didn't do was not good enough, is to clarify what is performance in the company. We have finally clarified. And performance is about creating value for people, for planet, for customer, but also for the PNL. And every leader now, every leader in the organization has a goal in financial, but a goal in carbon footprint, with a forecasting on carbon, not only financial forecasting. So the need to clarify good performance was what we have clarified last year. Uh, and that has been really a big leapfrog in people's commitment. So people cannot live in dilemma. So do I save the planet or do I save the wallet? No, it's both. And Geraldine, you were a chief financial officer before all of this. So you were probably measuring everything in sight. And, um, and perhaps that's part of uh, the way you think about things. But how do you know whether you're going fast enough in a space like this? That's a really tough question. Um, how do we know if we go fast enough? I think there's two elements. Um, one is uh, actually talking to your stakeholders. Uh, and I have one to my right uh, who is pushing us all the time, <laughs> which are our customers. Uh, so I think it's very important to be very aware of what's going on there. Um, but also, it's a matter of how does it anchor into your culture. And it's interesting what you were just saying. So we are very much an innovation-driven company. 
uh, and we've embedded in our incentives the non-financials for more than 10 years now. So 50% of our of our incentives are financial and 50% non-financial throughout the whole company. And with that, you try to give a signal of indeed increasing pace. Um, but if I take a if I take a, a broader perspective, I think when you start knowing that you're not going fast enough is when you're being left behind. Um, and I think I'm just really, me as a person, when you, f when you know you're going fast enough is when it feels very uncomfortable because you're starting to take positions and bets and putting capital on things which aren't underpinned by regulation or aren't underpinned by existing commercial contracts or you're taking some risk. Uh, and I think that's when you know that you're probably at the right speed. So basically, there's no, there's no speed without risk. I love it. Um, and you're a co-CEO, which you know, is not often tried. And when we're talking about leadership in this space, what benefits does that bring in dealing with some of the complexities that we deal with in this sort of space? Well, you referred to my predecessor, Fika, And people said, oh my gosh, when he leaves, it's big shoes to fill. And we were smiling and we said, yeah, but we have four feet. Um, which, uh, which, by the way, speaks to speed. Uh, because it is possible in some organizations that the top of the organization is actually the bottleneck. Uh, and we're very complementary in styles and in backgrounds and in skills. And we're fully aligned in where we want to go and our values. So when you've got that, you can actually get more done faster. Uh, and that's the big, big advantage uh, that we're seeing. And we've been going for two years through the pandemic, which, of course, was a big crisis to manage. So in on the one hand, you have to manage your going operations, etc., And you have to keep an eye on the future and where you want to take the company. So it's a lot to cover. Um, and we find it very helpful that we're too. It'd be interesting a little later on to come on to the pandemic and its impact. Because, uh, I, I, I think it's been an accelerant in many ways. Uh, historically, when something like that would have happened, climate, sustainability, circularity, all that stuff would have gone on the back burner. John, you did ask us to interrupt, so I'll Go. In interrupt. Um, one of the things that we've seen clear as day is the pandemic has accelerated a bunch of consumer trends that were already there. So the kind of digitization of everything, e-shopping, e-purchasing, e-media consumption, e-payments, has been massively accelerated, but so has conscious consumption. So we can measure that people are making more conscious brand choices, particularly young people are uh, paying more attention to the social and environmental impact of how they spend their dollar, euro, yen. Um, it's very Many, many surveys showing uh, that step up in conscious consumption. I think the most startling effect, uh, fact is that the New York Stern Business School has identified that in the last 24 months, 50% of all growth across all FMCG categories has come from brands making sustainability promises. How closely linked do you think that might be? Because it's always a question. If a, if a brand does come into a new area or, or, or a, an interesting area, it, it's very often just a function of the fact it's a good brand anyway. Well, uh, our own data is the following. Uh, we track how cons consumers perceive our brands in every category in almost every country monthly. And one of the questions we ask about our and our competitor brands are, does this brand make a positive contribution to society or the environment? And the Unilever brands that index highly on that score are growing three times faster now than the rest of our portfolio. And so is it correlation or is it causation? I don't know. I'm not sure I care either. Um, sustainable brands are just growing faster for us. Alan, thank you. And, and anyone else wants to sort of dive in with all four feet or all two feet? Um, I don't know if I should wait for a minute. Let's wait until it's done. Thank you. Um, no, I, I was going to add something that I think is a takeout from this pandemic, which is to me very, very important. 
first, the capacity of uh, research and technology. I mean, it's amazing how, far, how fast, how far, how much capital has been deployed, how much concentration. And uh, we probably advanced, um, I don't know, a couple of decades in a couple of years, something like that, or in a year and a half. That, if uh, replied in the climate uh, side, I think uh, is a huge opportunity that has to be taken into consideration. But there's another one, which is uh, regulation. I mean, if you think about it, confining the world is the most stringent, the most aggressive, the most necessary, but the most extreme measure that regulatory-wise the world has taken in its history, as far as I can tell, uh, peaceful. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go to that, but frankly, we have a problem as big, if not bigger, than the pandemic uh, coming towards us. And uh, the regulatory measures we're taking, they're all, to say the best, regional, to say the best. I would also add some adjectives like weak and often uh, middle of the ground, not wanting to. So those two lessons, if we can solve a pandemic through regulatory measures, and, um, and technology and science, Christ almighty, we should be able to do more about this one. Well, j just to, uh, when I was listening to Alan, and I was listening to Covencio, and I was listening to Geraldine, I was thinking these are companies that are driven by, shaped by consumers. Not always directly, but, but very much so. Your business is, because it's infrastructure and things like that, is a very different market. And I wonder whether you see similar trends that, that, that we've heard from the other three, or whether, I've always seen in infrastructure markets as very conservative, quite traditional, very cost-driven, uh, and quite often quite corrupt. So what, what well, sort of world do you see? Well, that's much less of it nowadays uh, than it used to be, thank God. In fact, I think that's kind of not a major issue um, around the world. and. Um, Yes, but at the end of the day, our industries, the infrastructure industry, is driven by consumers also, although there's an intermediary, which is normally the administrations or the private entities that uh, command these projects, these large projects, who are in turn moved by their own uh, customers. And their own customers, at the end of the day, are either voters, uh, their constituencies, their investors, you name it. But at the end of the day, it's the indirect uh, pressure is the same. And yes, indeed, we do see there is a huge um, improvement in. I mean, the amount of the amount of attraction we have uh, generated as a brand, and the advantage, the competitive advantage we've generated as a brand uh, by having uh, led these uh, uh, sustainability elements is amazing. I mean, it's, uh, we can, there's more business that we can deal with, which is not always good as a result of that. Fantastic. So uh, what I'd like to do is slightly shift gear, and, and I'm, I'm bearing in mind that we will bring, please. You talked earlier about fossil fuel relegations. Can everyone hear? Thank you very much. You talked earlier about fossil fuel delegations outnumbering any other nation, but you have on your panel today a fossil fuel executive in the shape of Jose Manuel, who is right now building waste incinerators all over the world, particularly in my community in North London, one of the top 10 most deprived racially diverse communities in the UK. It is massively oversized. About 60% of its feedstock is recyclable, but it's cheaper to burn it. And so what I want to know is, here we hear about the blah, blah, blah of corporate words and no action. I want to know whether you will hold to your pledge of 100% clean energy at Atsiona and withdraw from bidding for this massively oversized, locally opposed incinerator, which the Mayor of London has vocally come out against. Thank you for the question. Uh, Cosio Manuel, I think Thank you we, very much. we do need to respond to that instantaneously, but it would be quite good if the two of you could sort of have a word afterwards. Over to you. Right. Um, I'm not sure whether your concern is whether it's massively oversized or the actual technology, or both. Because you said that it's massively oversized. Both. Both. Um, incineration is an old technology, and okay. it's oversized, which means importing waste okay, from the, other the, areas, the and your technology doesn't remove dioxins. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, well, it's not the place to have a debate about it. The massive oversizing of the plant is uh, something that is uh, beyond our control. So it's a specific issue of the plant about uh, the waste to energy concept. You would probably agree with me that as a transition, as a transition mechanism, maybe not in London, that is a debatable argument, but in a great portion of the world, it is the only possible solution for the time being. Let's let, let, let me suggest, firstly, that you get in touch afterwards. I, you, you may already be so. But um, I think what this also illustrates, and this isn't trying to sort of marginalize this issue at all, is that any company that declares a dedication or commitment to leadership positions is going to find things in its existing portfolio which are, in some cases, deeply problematic. And how you then deal with that, I think, is going to be uh, a key part of the leadership challenge. Geraldine. As I said, I was, I was wanting to slightly shift gear, not necessarily in that direction, but thank you uh, for that. Um, financial markets, because we've talked about consumers to some degree, we've talked about uh, customers. Unless financial markets really get behind this and reward it, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, I look at the ESG stampede in the moment. I mean, we're a herd animal, so we like to do feeding frenzies. We saw just recently something like $2 trillion worth of ESG assets stripped of that labeling because people had overclaimed. What sort of um, evolutionary trend have you seen in the financial market interest in what DSM has been doing and is planning to do? I have to say we're in a very... Uh, fortunate position in the sense of directly what DSM is because we've been an ESG stock for many, many years. Uh, and uh, the food systems and our innovations are a pros prosperous ground for us to do this. I have to be honest, it's, it's easier. Um, having said that, I've been a CFO of, of a listed company for more than 10 years and I have seen a massive evolution in a, the fact that the questions are being asked by a much broader set of investors. So they, we came from a time when it was very niche. But what we're seeing now is, of course, there is um, interest, even pressure from pensioners, from investors who say, we want our money to be invested in the right kind of actions and technology. So I have seen certainly a much better conversation, also helped by Mark Carney, to be honest. The systemic risk of climate has turned the equation upside down. For a long time, companies like ours were trying to, to sort of demonstrate how interesting and useful it is. Now it's coming uh, from above. I do believe that there is, um, however, still a, a very live dilemma going on right now. And that is, as an investor, do you take the position of I divest of all companies that aren't perfect? Or do I insist on transparency, roadmaps, actions, measurements, etc., and stay on board and effectively speed up and enable the transformation the whole of society is trying to get to? And here, it's not an easy dynamic which is going on right now. But fundamentally, of course, the second one is the one which is the more positive outcome than simply saying, I, I, I let go, because if you let go, but the need is still out there, the change will simply not happen. It's just going to be outside of the public markets. So I have seen a, a great evolution. I think there is still a strong conversation to be had, and I'm on the board of focusing capital on the long term, for example, which has been doing a lot of work between asset owners, asset managers, and corporates, of saying, how do we align better what we're trying to achieve and, and one of the fundamental needs is clarity of roadmaps and the truth is these roadmaps sometimes do take longer than one would wish but if they're there we can walk along them together so a serious indication of real change in this space would be restructuring of existing companies you know we've seen it in the fossil fuels business being recommended, good and bad shells or whatever. Um, I'd like just to sort of, before I open this out to the, 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 the audience, to have Alan and Covencio and Jose Manuel talk a little bit about your inter, own interactions with the financial markets and investors. Alan, Unilever has been quite innovative in that space. Anything you'd like to discuss? 
Uh, well, actually, to be honest with you, my head's buzzing about the subject of waste. Um, and uh, maybe we could come back to that uh, at some point. On financial uh, markets and the impact of financial markets, just two observations. Um, I'm still quite a rookie CEO, kind of two and a half years into it, still figuring it out. Um, and a year and a, two years ago, we hardly had a conversation about ESG, terrible term, uh, with investors. But now on occasion, that's the entire subject of a mainstream portfolio manager wants to understand what are you doing on carbon, what are you doing on waste, what are you doing on human rights? And these are hardcore portfolio managers. So the, the nature of the conversation is changing. Are the asset allocation decisions changing? I don't think so, not as fast. And then earlier this year, we became the first company uh, to voluntarily put our climate transition plan to a shareholder vote. And uh, we laid out, we kind of had to make it up. What does a, a carbon transition plan look like? So we laid out our plan for our brands, for our operations, for our value chain, uh, for advocacy. How would we measure and report? What were we struggling with? We're struggling with what's the right price for carbon, for example. And our board was quite nervous about putting this up for shareholder vote. Um, but actually, we got 99.6%, 99.59, I don't want to exaggerate, uh, shareholder support um, for the plan. And it'll change. Every three years, we'll refresh it and change it. But I think that, that landslide support for just having a plan uh, shows that the capital markets are interested in this space. Thank you. Yeah, in our case, we are built for purpose because uh, Inca is uh, owned by a foundation. So basically everything that we make either goes back to the business or goes to the foundation to achieve the charitable purpose. But we also have within Inca holding um, a group of companies which is Inca Investment. And in here is a 23 billion euros uh, group. And here we optimize, we don't maximize financial returns. We optimize the carbon sequestration with our investment and uh, reasonable financial return. So it's not maximizing, but optimizing. And this is, and we measure our investment in our capacity to absorb CO2. I want also to add basically what you also said is about the financial investors. I think up to now, it's about investor uh, moving money from A to B, which is right. I think we have to go one step further because the real benefit is the actual uh, uh, business benefits into the PNL. Because being smart in climate is being smart in resources. And being smart in resources is being smart in cost. So somehow sustainability is and has to be the new low cost business model for companies. And by doing that, investor will put money there. So if we go from branding to actual uh, business, I think we can really take off much more. I sense, uh, I sense uh, an eruption coming from Geraldine. No, 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 a, a build and an add-on, which is we must also remember that one of the big sources of capital is, of course, debt. And so we were one of the first companies to have an RCF, a revolving credit facility of a billion, linked to us delivering on our greenhouse gas absolute reductions. And what is very good news is to see that the markets are starting. When we did it, it took 10 banks and it was a long discussion. And now what we're seeing is this is starting to become a little more understood. And I think there you can truly link the right to operate with the delivery of what the capital is there for. And, and we're seeing that, uh, you know, green bonds were sort of struggling for a long time. This is, you know, but it's only one mechanism. So I think we need to broaden our, our ability and our uh, um, um, transparency, to be honest, around linking outcomes with capital. And it can be equity, it can be debt, uh, that type of thing. Thank you. Hoseman, well, what's your experience? On this, um, there's another side, <clears throat> not to repeat what my colleagues have mentioned, but there's another side to it, which is um, de-risking of projects. In, in our business, uh, doing a very risky demonstration projects is a kind of a, it's, it's a norm. We have to go and try, a, 25 years ago, a CSP plant, which uh, no one had done in 20 years before, and it wasn't very efficient. So the situation now allowing you for de-risking elements in your financing is uh, a deal 
is a deal maker as opposed to a deal breaker. So, um, for example, if you're going to do a very, uh, very strange um, hydrogen plant, or very strange, as weird, as not, not done before, hydrogen plant, and you have a financing where will give you less strain on the cash flow um, the, and the cash flow obligations that you have to cover in case you, you undercome some, you come into trouble, uh, that gives you a lot of leeway, and that's also happening. I mean, the understanding, the, quali the qualitative side of financing nowadays, not only the quantitative, which is normally a lot more, less expensive, but a lot cheaper financing, but also the qualitative side of the, of the financing is making a great difference. Well, it's interesting. I think what you're all doing and your, your investor relations staff are doing is bringing analysts and investors up a learning curve. So thank you for that. Any, um, qu yes, please, could, could, well, let me just give you a, um, the microphone, but don't run away with it. Um. Thank you very much. My name is Olivia Lazard. I work for Carnegie Europe. Um, Geraldine, you mentioned something really interesting about the relationship between speed and risk taking. Um, could you give one concrete example of that? And the second, what, what do you, collectively need from public governance actors to help you take risks and um, learn in return in terms of standards, regulation, etc. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, let me give you a, an example which is linked to, we're a science-based company, we do a lot of innovation and innovation requires looking into the future and, and it can take many, many years to get to it. So one very um, simple example, about more than 10 years ago, uh, we did an ideation exercise around climate and we thought, how do we DSM, the, the world's biggest company when it comes to micronutrients for what makes food nutritious for humans and animals can do about climate? And one of our realizations, which is a word you've heard a lot about here at the COP, is methane. Uh, one of the biggest sources of methane is methane burped by cows which is not a very sexy topic, um, but a very important one because methane is 28 times more potent than CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, 10 years ago, I can tell you this came across as a very weird topic. It was actually more than 10 years by now. And our scientists were just passionate about trying to understand what's going on in the gut of the cow. And, and then we went to talk to farmers who said, why do I care? I don't pay for my cows burping. Um, governments were not quite there, etc." Now, we invested real money behind this. This is not just a couple of scientists. Then you start really doing trials. We've done trials with more than 30,000 cows across 16 countries over 10 years, regulatory filings, and you name it, to check. Because we have a feed ingredient that if you put a quarter of a teaspoon in the feed of a cow, it reduces by 30% at least on dairy cows and nearly 80% on beef. But the number of times we discuss should we keep going with this, um, is a risk taking. Now, fast forward 10 years, the world suddenly, methane pledge, great. There's interest in methane. We can do something about it with zero infrastructure requirements. It's just changing the feed of, of these animals. And we're pleased. But of course, we've had others that haven't worked out, where we were either too early or we didn't have the science, or somehow it's still not there. And so, managing your degree of appetite and ability to fund, because you need an ongoing business to fund innovation and research, you have to find the right balance. So that's one example. And where things can help is sometimes sharing that risk. So if you think about some of the hard things that's just, that humanity needs to fix, sharing that risk is very helpful. And that's where funds which support innovation um, are extremely helpful, where regulation can be supportive, for example, as well. These are the kind of, of things I would Thank you, Geraldine. What, I, what I'd love to see is if anyone else is uh, minded to answer Olivia's question, and I, I just want a bit of context. I spent decades in this field, uh, and for most of that time, civil society wanted to keep business out of politics because we did not trust business to do the right thing. What we're beginning to talk about is business now coming in and adding its voice. So, Alan, how do you think about that? Well, I didn't think you were going to come to me there, John. I was uh, zoning out a little bit. Um, well, look, uh, th there, I would go back to what I said at the beginning, which is these very, very big challenges, government alone cannot solve. Business alone cannot solve. Civil society alone cannot solve. It requires a degree of collaboration. That's why all sectors are represented here at COP. So, uh, we 
every big issue that we tackle has got an advocacy component to it. Um, here we're talking about climate, the climate emergency. Um, but if we were talking, for example, about uh, equality and representation and inclusion, we would follow the same model. We would try and get our own act in order. We'd see what we could do with our value chain and our brands. And you bet we're lobbying with uh, business, uh, lobbying with government and uh, working in partnership with NGOs. Most of the big problems require some collaboration. It's interesting because can I just check if there's another question or comment from anyone? <laughs> Let me start here and then come there. Thank you very much. Um, Anna Longley from Dentsu. Um, the net zero transition is critically dependent on human and societal behavior change. But the anger and demand that we see in the climate stri strikes doesn't always translate to individual behavior change at home. And in fact, the IKEA Globescan research talks about the gap between the 70% who demand change and the 6% who take action, with cost often cited as a barrier. Um, Alan, you've in the past talked about sustainability as a driver of supply chain optimization, and you've obviously been successful in overcoming some of these barriers around cost. It would be very interesting to hear from you some of the lessons learned. You've touched on three of the four elements of why we believe there is no trade-off between a commitment to sustainable business and a commitment to strong financial performance. So uh, there is a very dangerous and seductive illusion that gets spread around of how do you balance sustainability with strong financial performance. I think the minute you enter that dialogue framed that way, uh, business is finished as, an as a good actor in this space. So our evidence set that we're building is pretty simple. Our sustainable brands are growing faster, so there's a growth imperative. We've taken out 1.2 billion euros of cost through sustainable sourcing, largely en energy. Um, it we're for sure reduces risk, macro risk and micro risk. A planet that's on fire and underwater is not a great place for a consumer products company. Equally, you know, we got it wrong on a couple of issues around Black Lives Matter last year, but. I think because of the partnerships and the relationships we'd built up over time, we got very good advice and counsel to help get us out of the pickle that we got ourselves in. So growth, cost, risk, and then the most important part of the business case is it's a magnet for talent. Try hiring young people these days into a business that doesn't have a positive reputation for how it conducts itself. It's impossible. Um, so when we put those four things together, uh, we reject the notion that there's a trade-off between sustainability and economic delivery. One purpose should be a pathway to better profits. Let me take, let me take that as a masterclass and, and go on to the next question. And since you're sitting next to each other, what I'll do is um, give the microphone to you both. Well done. Um, and then we'll, we'll take the uh, answers severally. But what I would like to do at the end is ask each of the panelists just to give some sort of summary and two questions. One is what um, advice would you give to next generation leaders, not necessarily always in your company or, or sector, but what have you learned that you think that they ought to um, know? And then what would one thing would you really like to happen by the time we get to COP 30, let's say, but um, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Hayden, and I'm, I'm the state purchasing agent for our state, and we want to regulate in the right way. So from a consumer lens, how does a consumer, and Geraldine already knows I asked this question, what lens should they look at when they look at a product as to whether something is carbon zero or carbon friendly, and is there a universal standard we can introduce in the state for a worldwide standard for that purpose? Thank you. Should we just take the next one? Thank you. Beth Feloff, Coalition of Sustainable Communities, New Mexico. Um, since, uh, since scope three swamps scopes one and two, um, supply chain means everything. How are you managing your supply chains and the data so that you can assure customers that your products are in fact carbon neutral? Scope three, do we, does everyone have the rest of the day? But let's see how we can. Well, no, scope, uh, yeah. 
I can take. Um, uh, both are strongly connected. What is the standard? We have invested a massive amount of resources and time in defining what is our real footprint. Because this, as you say, is the scope three that matter the most in many of the companies, at least in, in this type of companies. So it's about tracking and traces, and it's about auditing data from the climate point of view, and it's about set clear plans. So I can hardly put more focus on the need to have a trustable way to measure your real footprint. And this is not uh, spoken well enough. Eh? And then, of course, how do you convert this standard into an official standard that everybody can trust? So you, you don't have your own customized solution, but it's really, and this is where we personally are really working with a lot of NGOs in order to really help and support and define the right standard. But we measure 100% that. And then the point here, it's about how do you uh, convert this into everybody's language? Because this is quite technical. I have personally gone in depth on these topics. And the more you go in depth, the more complexity you understand to see. So I think it's our responsibility as a company to convert this into people's language, that people can have a clear point. Then I would say we have to take one step more. It's not about doing good things. It's about helping consumers to really uh, understand and help them in their life. How can they reduce waste? How can they reduce food? How can they reduce electricity? How can they make smart choices, yeah. as Alan said? So how can we build trust there? And I think trust is the key thing uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Juvencio. And I think just in the interest of time, because we're right up against the clock, what I would like to do is to invite one observation on those two themes, or either or uh, of the themes for each of our panelists. And if I can start the, um, the powder train at this end, Jose Manuel, with you, and let it run and blow up, uh, Alan, at the other end, that would be great. I was thinking a recommendation for, you, for new for generation for the what I call the, the purpose generation, which is kind of the Y and Z uh, generations put together, the, the purpose generation, they are absolutely focused on what they want to do. Frankly, they have the drive, they have the tools, they have the, the definitely the commitment, the purpose. So I would just um, recommend that they don't despair, that they continue pushing and uh, doing all they can, both on a personal side, both on a, on a professional side, and on a political side, just continue pushing. We need a lot of push there. Thank you. Geraldine. Um, the one aspect we haven't talked much about is the just transition. And I have to say that uh, being with a company where we've been on, on the environmental aspects for many, many, many years, um, what I feel the next generation really needs to help us start to own but do even better is how do we really think about ourselves as part of society and take, therefore, part of the responsibility of a, not only a just transition but the whole uh, equality, uh, inequalities. I mean, we are in the food systems. There's a billion farmers in the world of which half live in absolute poverty. That's not okay. Um, and I think they're, you know, the next generation, I really hope, is going to do a much better job. Um, we're trying, but there'll be still probably a lot to be done. So, so far, the asks have been very strongly linked. So, Juvencio, are you going to break the chain? Or? <laughs> no, it's okay. What I would like to see. You know, wars, when people make commitment, give us hope. But these actions that create credibility. So what I would like to see is actions in the next uh, two, three years. Because it's, it's important that we, we ourselves set actions and commitment for 20, 21, 25. Because we cannot procrastinate to the next generation of CEOs uh, the responsibility to solve their problems. So I would like, as we are committed as well, to see actions follow up. Thank you. And Alan? I'd like to make two comments, if I may. First, I'd like to ad directly address your question. Um, we're very interested in eco-labeling to help consumers make smarter choices. There are more than 500 different eco-labels uh, in the world already, and no one is perfect. Uh, my own conviction is that 20 years ago, none of us knew what a calorie was on, a, on food packaging. 
now we know to look for the calories and we know that 50 doesn't matter too much, but 500, you should be a bit careful. Uh, we want to label the carbon footprint on all of our products as a, as a single fact base um, for decision making. Uh, I think that's more useful than the hybrid eco-labeling systems, but there's no agreed standard for doing that. So we've now tried to identify the full scope carbon footprint of 70,000 products in our range. We think that they're accurate to about 80%, and we're going to start putting that on pack, the full scope carbon end-to-end -end label. I, if you were looking for one, I wouldn't try and design your own scheme at state level. There's already too many, but if there's one simple metric that I think would be helpful for people to have, it's the carbon footprint uh, of the products. As far as the one, th the one action I would, or the one thing I would love to dream to see in the future, it would not be by 2030, it'd be by 2025, and it would be a worldwide price on carbon. Well, thank you all four. And I just wanted to make a very personal observation. You know, when I first came into this field, getting any CEO to talk about anything in this space would have been incredibly difficult, if not actively impossible. The very fact that these days we almost take it for granted, not just that CEOs will take a panel like this and begin to respond to some of the questions and comments that you've come up, and thanks all, all of you for your, your, your patience, but we'll actually sort of start to distill some of their learning and spread that to the wider world. I think it's, I take great comfort from that. And I just hope that my personal hope would be that will accelerate uh, and well beyond the usual suspect uh, companies. And, and you know, we'd, we've heard of all of your companies in different ways over quite a long time. We've got to get that out to the wider world of state-owned enterprises, family-owned businesses, and so on and so forth. But thank you immensely, all four of you. Uh, for what you do, and I'll now release you into the tender mercies of the uh, audience. Thanks, John. Thank you all very much. <laughs>